used of scare tactics, frightening consumers with non-existent risks. But the critics say the new technology is unpredictable, and if it goes wrong, the health effects could be far-reaching. A 1989 case showed just how unpredictable the results of genetic science can be. It concerned L-tryptophan, a little-known diet supplement most popular in the United States. The Japanese makers had genetically modified their product, but in the process, they created a poison and a new illness called EMS. 1,500 people were affected, 37 died. It affected people's heart, their breathing, it caused stiffness in the joints, um, it uh, caused um, thickening or, or fibrosis in many places, affect their thinking, affect their eyes, affect their hearing. Um, it practically is unprecedented that some little tiny impurity like this could have such a wide effect on the body. Barbara Sigafus took L-tryptophan to help her sleep. She was left permanently disabled. I had a muscle damage and the nerves underneath your skin, they were damaged. The skin is damaged. I suffer from pulmonary problems, um, epilepsy, heart problems. One time the kids and I counted like nine or ten things that were wrong with me, which I did not have before taking the L-tryptophan. At the time of the disaster, it was claimed that a fault in the factory purification process was the real cause. Some scientists say the genetic modification was not a factor. Any disaster could happen as a result of a fault in processing. Any food plant can break down, any product can be produced that's not hygienic, that's not up to spec or whatever. This is a result, nothing whatsoever, a mile away from the genetic modification. It's a result of the production process going wrong and, and the, the quality control breaking down. But lawyers acting for the victims tell a different story. New York attorney Paul Reingold represented many of the families and forced the manufacturers to reveal what really happened. He says their own documents show genetic modification was the root cause. It created a toxin and a faulty process failed to stop it getting through. A genetic change produced the impurity. I don't even think there's any question about it. I think that truly what we're dealing with here is a combination of the process and the impurity that they introduced by this genetic tinkering. Janet Kennedy was one of seven people in Britain to fall victim to EMS. She'd been given a prescription pill containing L-tryptophan. Well, when I was finally admitted into hospital, I was gasping for breath. Everything was wrong. Nothing was working. I was just, I had hardly any blood, hardly any oxygen. I was just in a terrible state. I was even afraid to sleep in case I popped off. Horrendous. As a result of the illness, she had to give up her job. And even today, nine years on, she lives in constant pain. I do worry about the future in a sense. Because I just hope that... I don't know what I hope, actually. It's not when I die, it's how I'll die sort of thing. The L-tryptophan tragedy suggests there may be hidden dangers in genetic modification. A tiny proportion of the population took it, but hundreds fell ill. Now, millions of us eat GM ingredients and their byproducts every day. So have the regulators learnt any lessons? I'm just a lawyer who was involved in litigation, and it seems to me scientists are the appropriate ones to say what the risks are. But nonetheless, I think it's, it's obvious to me that um, through a lawyer's perspective of what went on here, that there are these risks and that there's relatively easy ways to catch the risks if a government has the, the strength to say to people who want to bring a product into the country, let's check it out first. Last week it was revealed that MPs had removed GM food from all menus in Parliament. A Commons written answer said members didn't know enough about the science and preferred to avoid the food until it was proven absolutely safe. 
But what about the rest of us? Next month, there'll be new laws requiring better labelling. But critics say they don't go far enough, and the foods will remain difficult to avoid. The majority of genetically engineered products will not be labelled. Products like lesser thin, which is in your chocolate and, and cakes and so on. Products like soy oil, vegetable oil. Just look on the foods when you buy them from the supermarket. How many products contain vegetable oil? These will not be labelled, even though they've come from genetically modified plants. As more GM food reaches the shelves and our stomachs, more research comes to light calling the safety into question. Up to now, scientists have agreed the DNA present in the food is broken down and destroyed by powerful acids in our stomach. Government health advisors have dismissed theories that this DNA could get into our own genes and cause damage. Some say it simply couldn't happen. It's something that is, I suppose, a remote theoretical possibility, but it's not a normal mechanism. The transfer of genes into human cells um, is not a problem, it's not something that can happen. And you would understand that if you understood the nature of the complexity of the human genome. At Cologne's Institute of Genetics in Germany, the news isn't so reassuring. Here, Dr. Walter Dörfler has been feeding foreign DNA to mice. Using a fluorescent dye, his team have been able to trace its journey through the body after the animals have eaten it. The DNA can even cross the placenta and can be seen inside the brain cell of a baby mouse. Our experiments have shown that this DNA is not completely broken down to the building blocks, but remains in fragmented form and this DNA can be taken up into the organism. We don't know the consequences of what this transfer of foreign DNA to all sorts of cells in the animal's body could mean. But of course it's not so difficult to imagine that it might have adverse effects. Could that have consequences, say, in terms of causing mutations or causing cancerous growth or many other things. But that's in the realm of, of speculations and of future possibilities. The chair of the government's safety committee said she was unaware of Dr. Durfler's mice studies. But the research was first published in 1994. There's a vast amount of scientific literature in the, in the public domain. It is unbelievable. Um, one single paper producing one piece of evidence followed up some many years later may or may not be scientifically valid. It may or may not be something that needs investigation. However, having a collection of 16 world-leading scientific experts in their own particular field, they are obviously going to be familiar with the body of knowledge and the developments in the body of knowledge um, from their own particular point of view, and obviously those things will be picked up. Well, we've seen this before, haven't we? We've seen it with the pesticide DDT. We're told for years it was safe, nothing to worry about, until you know, it, we started to find out more and more. We heard it with BSC. We, how many years we were told that BSC wasn't going to affect the human population? So we've heard this before. You know, we've got to see more long-term and more thorough testing of these foods before they're put into the food chain, and that's not happening at the moment. In recent weeks, the number of raids on genetically modified crop sites has been increasing. And we've been trying to put one simple question to the biotech company Monsanto. Have they themselves studied the long-term effects on animals given a diet of genetically modified food? While filming at this demo, we were approached by the company's scientist in charge of the test site. Have you tested this stuff on animals on long-term tests? This stuff is exactly what's been grown in Canada commercially for the last two years. But have you tested it oh, on sort of long-term animal tests? Long-term, no. It's, it's had the usual, the, the usual toxicity tests. I'm, uh, I'm not sure what tests are done. I'm not involved in all the, the safety tests, obviously. But the, all the information has been, has been looked at by the regulatory authorities and scientists in many countries over 20 countries and they say it's safe. If you've not done long-term animal tests, as you said, um, well, we how don't can do we be sure we that it's safe for humans? We don't do long-term long animal tests on any new variety. Well, uh, why not? Because they're, they're, they're not done. We've all been eating genetically modified soya in hundreds of processed foods for more than a year. In Kent, the Education Authority has banned the ingredients from school menus. 
But by the time these children are fully grown, those products could well be present in the vast majority of foods they eat. Critics say GM foods have been allowed into Britain on the basis of only short-term health studies on animals. So why the rush from laboratory to supermarket shelf? Well, it seems quite apparent the government seems to be preferring the business interest than the consumer interest. We've seen over the last few years deregulation, we've seen the processes speeded up to ensure that these foods get onto the shelves. And we think that consumers should come first. We think, you know, it's, it is people's food. We're not talking about some experiment in a lab here. We're talking about what we eat, what we feed our children. And we think we need to take a lot longer term perspective on these foods and not rush them in like what's happening at the moment. Nothing is risk free. Um, I've said several times, for instance, that we're sitting here in a room and we couldn't guarantee that the ceiling wouldn't fall down. We can, however, to the best of our knowledge and the scientific information that's available, and this is very, very detailed, and remember this, the committee consists of 16 absolute top scientific experts, and so we can do what we call risk assessment. We can look at the facts and we can ensure that the foods are safe to go into the food chain. Inside the mind of a killer. He took one of these and have it pinned up on his wall. <laughs>